welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Harris Gardner, a prolific poet and a tireless poetry promoter. Harris has become renowned in Greater Boston for bringing poetry to the public in a variety of inviting, unusual ways. He has hosted readings in historic churches, major hotels, art galleries, nightclubs, and the beautiful chapel at Forest Hill Cemetery. Harris co-founded and co-hosts Boston's National Poetry Month Festival, now in its 14th year. He also co-hosts Breaking Bagels with the Bards, a weekly poetry community in Davis Square, Cambridge. In addition to being a catalytic agent, as Harris calls himself, he also edits poetry for the Ibbotson Street Journal, and he served as poet in residence at Endicott College for several years. In all of those roles, he has given local poets a chance to be heard and to find an appreciative audience. Harris's own writing has found an enthusiastic readership. He has published three volumes of verse and been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. His poems have appeared in the Harvard Review, Midstream, Main Street Rag, and Muddy River Poetry Review, just to name a few. I'm delighted that Harris is here to talk about writing, promoting, and the onion skin quality of good poetry. Harris, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Elizabeth. Thank you. So you have a poem for us that relates to the onion skin quality of poetry. Would you read it for us? Be glad to. <clears throat> this is called Restoring the Bathroom Window. Gordian knots are undone, arduously, one by one. The cord is released to raise the blind. Opaque glass soon becomes as clear as an epiphany. Vision surges unbound, internal and beyond that which frames the interior world. Chipped paint is methodically stripped. Bare bone sill is massaged with sandpaper. A lavish coat leaves a clean sheen. Michelangelo in my own mind. Next, the right side and the left receive the tr same transforming treatment. The top is beyond my reach, like more than a few elusive dreams. How it all gleams, a rebirth of space. The wall bears a refurbished eye, a window of possibility beckons. Bathroom doors look a bit weary, forlorn. Energy flows toward an expanded plan. First the portals, then What's further in store for this peerless Lazarus program? Perhaps I can restore the colors to autumn's crumbled leaves. No, that is not near my nascent skill. Aha, why not paint the sun's dazzle at day's end? Too late, it's already mounted on a canvas. Twilight drains the vibrant spectrum. Myriad stars gleam through the wall's one eye. Where's my smock? There are no bounds to what my brush might do. However, a gallon of semi-gloss is not eternal. Mm. There are so many wonderful phrases in that poem, and I think a lot of people could relate to the subject matter. But what is a poem about a bathroom window and painting have to do with an onion skin? Well, if you look at the surface of the program, it's just physical labor. If you look, peel back some of the layers of the onion and get more toward um, the under, undercurrent or the under language of the poem, then it's talking about clarity, obviously. Well, obvious to me. And uh, mm. it is a contrasting a clarity of focus, clarity of the inner self in the interior um, of the work itself. Mm -hmm. A lot of good poetry does have those two levels, and it sort of looks outward and inward at the same time. Is that one of the things that you like about that poem? One of the things, I'll go with one of the things, yes. What else do you like about the poem? Oh, the imagery, you know, the 
Um, the poem has a certain rhythm to it. Um, all good poetry you know, should have a certain rhythm which helps toward the, uh, I don't want to sound pedantic here, but the musicality of the line, mm -hmm. and um, which enhances the overall music of the poem. Mm -hmm. When I think of that idea of an onion skin, it can relate to individual poems, but it also relates to the many different roles that a poet has. And when you and I spoke about a week ago, you made some really interesting comments. You said that there are sort of three aspects of writing. And you described the super creator, which you said is part of the inspiration. And then there is inspiration and then perspiration, right. which is 80 to 90 percent of the work. Tell right. us a little bit more about that idea. Well, I mean, <clears throat> Well, a poem can start with an idea or can start with an image. Um, and that comes from uh, perhaps both beyond oneself and also within oneself. And then you have to find, well, where is that within coming from? So is that, it's sort of like a, a circle that has no exit to it because the it can begin with oneself, but it can also begin with above and beyond oneself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've answered the question. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the super creator yeah. and inspiration and right. perspiration. Perspiration, perspiration can be reduced to one significant word, revision. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's three words, revision, revision, revision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're revising a poem, do you feel like you are sort of uncovering the layers, or are you adding layers to the poem? That's a very good question. A little bit of both. Um, when you uncover layers, it can lead you in a, uh, either the same direction of the poem, or else it can you know, sort of uh, take you to another level um, beyond the uh, surface meaning of the poem. It's kind of like um, surgery, you know, you trim away the fat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've always admired about you as both a poet and a poetry promoter is your boundless energy. You just never seem to stop. Stop moving. And that's good. That's good for all of us. Yeah. But it makes me think of your story about how you started writing poetry to mm -hmm. begin with. Would you share that with us? Well, that, that's in a, in a far off galaxy in a long ago time. No. Um, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had this incredible English teacher. Uh, frequently, I think that's how a lot of people get started with some form of writing. And she was hard, but she really pushed us to our, find our maximum ability. Um, in my soft, I had her for four years of high school. In my sophomore year, we had an assignment to uh, do an original poem for homework. Uh -huh. And so I did the first poem, and I was intrigued by it, entertained by it, and I said, why not do another one? Uh -huh. And with that, I was off and running. Uh -huh. When we spoke last week, you said something that really caught my attention. You said you thought that writing might be a strength and you could see the finish line. Say again. <clears throat> we were talking about when you were in, in, um, in high school and you were looking at so many other students who might be athletically inclined. Mm -hmm. And you didn't feel that that was your strength, but that writing might be. And right. that's when you said that you could see the finish line. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that once you wrote that first poem, you didn't stop there. You just kept going and going and going. But there are different lengths to different races. Mm -hmm. You can run a marathon, and uh, that's one finish line. Mm -hmm. Or you can run a sprint, and there's another finish line. So mm -hmm. there are finish lines along the way to the mm -hmm. uh, one in the distance. Mm -hmm. So for you as a poet, how would you describe the race that you find yourself typically running? Is it a sprint or a marathon? 440 hurdles mm -hmm. um, in between. And 
the hurdles, I think, are an appropriate image because um, sometimes you have to stop and before you get to the finish line to let the poem breathe a little bit on its own mm -hmm. and make sure that you're not breathing for it. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That is great. And, and it's so accurate because it, at a certain point, a poem will kind of take on a life of its own. And you have to give it some distance and you have to respect what the poem wants to do. That's right. Because mm -hmm. the poem eventually may do and take you on an adventure that you hadn't planned on. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. Can you tell us about one adventure that poetry has taken you on? Well, um, I'll read it later, but it took me to an antique store. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was determined that I would write a poem on a found object. Mm -hmm. There's many different prompts to, to do a poem. A, a poem, as I said earlier, can come from an idea, a thought, an image, mm -hmm. or something concrete, you know, that's just staring you in the face mm -hmm. and demands to be written. Mm -hmm. When you go through an antique store, uh, there's a lot of things that won't call to you. You just have to look for the one object that does. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think I got off on a, uh, a little bit detour there, but... Well, that's okay. Actually, why don't you read that poem now? And oh. we'll close with an angel poem. We'll just switch it up a bit. Okay. What I found in that antique store was, um, that finally spoke to me, was a red wagon that many people know by its brand name, a Radio Flyer. And so this has a simple title, Radio Flyer. Cornered in your open, nostalgic nook, surrounded by lamps, bric-a-brac, and books, abandoned by a boy too soon grown to manhood, your engine, red body, your unbent wheels, still pristine, rust on your handle reveals unpainted vintage. Silent bells awaken memories to wonder why you were set aside. Who would surrender the swift downhill ride? Did you haul stacks of newspapers door to door on a well-known route? Were you a partner that carried the week's supplies bought at the neighborhood grocery store? What feckless youth turned the page when snow-tinted hair betrayed his age? Many men revert to boys that when they return to such a priceless childhood joy. Do you yearn for the one who treasured you last, for your wheels to spin as fast as in your prime? Now you dream not quite alone in the shop of curios and reveries. Soon another gleeful lad will appear and claim you unequivocally as his own. You will have a new home and a story that gleams. Mm. One of the things I like about that poem is the internal rhyme, which gets back to what you were saying about the necessity of music in mm. a poem. But I also like the way you gave that wagon sort of two lives, a past life and a future life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that poem has a current and an undercurrent. Well, the current is as a nostalgia piece. It, it, the wagon spoke to me because I did have a red wagon when I was um, a preteen. And um, I could have had that wagon, too, for just a, a, a tent spot. But I, I figured I didn't have any room for, mm -hmm. for the new old wagon. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it spoke to me. Um, uh, because it gave rise to imagining what his past life was, and then mm -hmm. toward the end, who would claim it? What mm -hmm. kind of person would find the same uh, joy in it that uh, m that I had in my youth? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm not that young anymore, but I mean. <laughs> I like the way that poem captures the essence of the wagon and you make sure that that is going to live on for a very long time. Even mm. if the wagon itself may not find a home, or at least not with you, it does have a life and it will have some permanence. Right. 
Mm -hmm. In addition to all of the poems that you write yourself, you also give incredible opportunities to a lot of poets because you have started so many venues in greater Boston. What makes you want to create a venue and give somebody a chance to read in front of an audience? Well, there we go again, referring, I have to refer to that factor as um, the catalytic agent in me. Mm -hmm. And I believe my purpose in calling here is to give voice to other voices and uh, other poetry and uh, because I, my personal belief is that poetry uh, exists to enhance the, uh, the, the common language. Mm. And, mm -hmm. um, and those others who, who kind of strive in the vineyards um, are sometimes under-recognized and even established poets um, should be given a greater voice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Mm. I love that idea of poetry enhancing the common language. Say a little bit more about how poetry might be able to do that. Is, well, a poem and poetry has its own vocabulary. And, and a, one of the requirements in my mind of poetry is that you reach for the freshest, most original language mm -hmm. to uh, create the, the visual impact of the poem. Mm -hmm. And a poem can be a narrative, but e equally a poem that shows more than tells has its own strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I answered the question. You did, <laughs> okay. definitely. When we were talking and I was asking you about all the effort you put into creating these venues, because it does take a lot of your time mm -hmm. and effort, you said that you want to leave behind a greater hole than your bones will leave in the ground, which I thought was a funny way of, of talking about a legacy. And you also said that your form of philanthropy is creating as many venues for as many people to have exposure. Right. I mean, it's a, the philanthropy of energy more than the Donatos. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, uh, there's no excuse for the lack of philanthropy because if you don't have the financial wherewithal, at least you can, you know, find other ways to give of yourself. Mm -hmm. mm. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is that you are so energetic. And when somebody attends one of your readings, you, that person can almost feel the energy radiating from you. Mm, that's interesting. Okay, thank you. I'll take that. You don't stop. You are just so full of passion and conviction and energy. Well, I guess I'm just a literary energizer bunny, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> In some ways, yes, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing for all of us. In fact, would you tell us a little bit about the Boston Poetry Marathon? Because that's only a few weeks away. Oh, please don't mind me. <laughs> Let's say is. Um, a good eight weeks away, that, that gives me a feeling I have a little more time. But um, we're in our 14th year uh, of the Boston National Poetry Month Festival, which I co-founded with Lainey Seneschal 14 years ago. And um, it's grown from a weekend festival to a four-day festival this April. April 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th. Uh, April. 10th will be an evening of poetry set to music, which has been organized by a member of my board, uh, Lucy Holstead. Mm -hmm. And then the 11th, from 11 to 4, will be 15 nationally recognized poets, which we, we refer in the program as keynote poets. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday and Sunday will be, um, was uh, the uh, nickname uh, Marathon of Poetry, mm -hmm. with um, two open mics and one workshop. Mm -hmm. What are you most excited about when you think ahead to this year's festival? Uh, some of the new people who have been added and the fact that it's the first time we've added uh, an evening of poetry set to music. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, I'm excited about the, um, it's 
taking on additional lives in addition to my own vision, mm -hmm. but they kind of mesh with my vision. Mm -hmm. The um, evening of poetry with music was a proposal to me by a board member. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And I ran with it. I said, go for it, as long as I don't have to exert any more energy mm -hmm. in addition to that, you know, what I already do. Mm -hmm. And um, the keynote poets were a new addition last year. We've added an extra hour to that. So instead of noon to four, it's 11 to four on the 11th. And um, we've got Lloyd Schwartz this year, among mm -hmm. others, mm -hmm. and um, XJ Kennedy and uh, Tino Villanueva, Alpha Weaver, um, the list could go on and on, but I don't think mm -hmm. we have time for me to give you the whole list. You said earlier that a poem can take on a life of its own. How about a poetry venue? Has that happened? I guess with the interaction between the curators, or the hosts of the venue, and the audience and the featured poets, the interaction and the growth and the size of the audience can add to the life of the venue and its popularity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's most satisfying for you as someone who organizes these readings? Um, they give me um, additional perspective on other voices in poetry and they also sometimes inspire me when I hear of a line that just kind of uh, knocks me out of my chair mm. and that I have to respond to it. So mm -hmm. sometimes it pays me back by helping me uh, to, uh, to find a new poem or a new poem to find me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also hearing the various voices and the artists and their styles, you know, brought us my own perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true. You said something interesting about why you like to combine unusual places and poetry. You said that that can be a connection between poetry and the spiritual side. It can. Um, very specifically, I had an eight and a half year run at the Forsyth Chapel at Forest mm -hmm. Hill Cemetery. That definitely the environment itself kind of lent itself to uh, poetry and the spiritual nature of uh, that one aspect of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, uh, that particular, the Globe, uh, and I quote the Globe as the Forsyth Chapel was the coolest place to hear poetry read. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was, um, that quote happened several years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember reading in that uh, chapel and being yeah. part of that series, and it was a cool place to read and to hear poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of nice mm -hmm. venues. Um, I, I had a program at the um, Cathedral Church of St. Paul across from Boston Common uh, when I think 9-11 happened. And I, I collaborated with Ram Devanini out of New York, mm -hmm. and uh, he's a publisher, I guess, of Rada Palix, and he created or, or built on the International Poetry Day in March. Mm -hmm. And he told me, if you want people to come, more people to come to poetry, then have it in unusual places. Mm -hmm. So he mm -hmm. was a motivator in that direction. I said, to myself, what could be more unusual than a cemetery? Mm -hmm. mm. Well, we are getting close to the end of our time, so I just want to share a statement you made and then have you end with one of your angel poems. Oh, all right. And the statement that you made that I thought was so beautiful was you said, all poets need an audience or the wind will carry away your words. I thought, ah, oh, that's beautiful. It's sad, it's beautiful, but it's also great motivation. Thank you. Hmm. And you have an angel poem that you were going to close sure. with? It's from Among Us, which is a chapbook collection published by Shravana Baba Press. Got to give the proper accreditation. Uh, this one is called Future Perfection. When you reach that elusive gate, the one marked entrance, 
They admit you with fanfare that suggests mistaken identity. Your name tag allows no error. As the polished brass rumbles shut, you notice the reverse sign posted. You heard that only fools plead their own cause. You also heard that few lawyers get wings to make the final flight. You lack professional guidance, so you present the performance of your afterlife. Your first sentence said with a shrug, I am a poet. You pause like that should explain your entire existence. Your poems were said to be divinely inspired. That should outweigh lines whose design hides the little flaws. The jury nods in agreement. The chief scribe is skeptical. He notes that you avoided form. You respond with newfound temerity. And for what measure was the world sans shape? The jurors shudder a lapse of propriety. The question rises as you hope to ascend. Is not poetry a thing of man's vanity? You reply, it is not vain to be human when art aspires to please earth and heaven. The jurors applaud your wit and words. The gavel slams into your confidence. A voice of thunder claps a warning. You hasten to say, good poetry is like prayer. So absent a cardinal sin, you hope for a positive decision. You rouse from a cosmic trance. You dwell between planes and lives. In one ear, you hear words in the other music. You watch the heavens as another poem writes itself across the moon. Ah, oh, thank you for those beautiful words, which will not just fly away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.